Good morning. Welcome to Brick Lane Community Church. I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus because He is who we are here to worship. Just one note before we begin, because of the live stream, of course, everything will be projected up on the screen. But if you are on site here this morning and you have a bulletin and you would like to sing parts and see the music, all of the songs are printed in the back of your bulletin. I think that would help us to worship if you're able to, to sing parts, that would be great. Nearly 400 years ago, a Puritan preacher wrote something that directly applies to what we are about to do. His name is Jeremiah Burroughs, and he was a member of the Westminster Assembly, of course, the assembly that penned the great Westminster Confession of Faith. Listen to what he said about worship. When you come to worship, take heed that you do not come on your own strength, for there is more required in sanctifying the name of God then your strength is able to carry you on. And so therefore, when you come to worship God, act your faith on Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Our God, we do acknowledge that in our own strength, we cannot worship you adequately. You are the creator and we're just creatures. You are the king. We're just subjects. You are our Father. We are mere children. God, you are mightier and wiser and holier than our minds can begin to grasp. Your splendor, your self-sufficiency, your eternal nature are beyond what we can imagine. And yet, amazingly, God, you invite us to worship you. And so this morning, we do so gladly and humbly, but certainly not without seeking your help. We know, God, that we cannot add to you any more glory. We can only ascribe to you the glory that you already have. And so would you be with us now as we act our faith on Jesus Christ, that you may be exalted and that we may be encouraged. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul understood very well that God is beyond our comprehension, which is the very reason that at the end of Romans 11, he bursts into a magnificent doxology. Could I ask you now if you're able to stand as we read that passage from Romans 11? This is what our God is like. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Remain standing as we sing.
Many of you are familiar with St. Augustine's famous prayer from his confessions when he prayed this. He said, O Lord, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Augustine, of course, was referring to the restless heart of an unbeliever before God grabs a hold of him and gives him faith to believe. And yet, don't you find that even as a Christian, you sometimes experience great inner turmoil when your soul is anything but restful. Of course, we are quick to blame this on externals, uh, stress caused by other people, or the pressures at work, the pressures at home. But the fact is, we are fretful because we are sinful. And just like all areas of life, the Bible offers us wise instruction this morning. I'm reading from Psalm 37. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, and like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger and turn away from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. Well, as we come to a time of confession, could I ask you to consider this one single question? How have the external pressures in your life exposed the internal sin in your heart? Could I ask you to bow silently and talk to God for a moment about these things? Our Father, we confess to you that our hearts are often restless. We tend to be at peace when you give us what we want, but we become fretful and angry when life is hard and when you seem unwilling to rescue us from uncomfortable and painful circumstances. God, we confess that we find it easier to delight in the things that we can see and touch and taste rather than in you. Some of us here look at the world around us with fear and doubt and wonder where you are. Others here are envious of the wicked who seem to have it so easy sometimes. 
God, some of us are haunted by guilty fears over sins we've committed, forgetting the wounds that scar your son and that plead our forgiveness. Some of us have been quick to become angry or have harbored secret resentment or even lashed out at others, perhaps in person or behind a screen. God, we don't always wait patiently for you because we forget that you are our stronghold in times of trouble. And we ask, Lord God, that you would forgive these sins this morning. Jesus Christ, we're grateful and we thank you that you didn't try to escape your discomfort while on this earth. Instead, you took the path of excruciating pain so that we might be rescued and forgiven. You obeyed perfectly, avoiding fear and envy and sinful anger. Jesus, you trusted patiently as your Father's plan was being carried out, even as it led to your death. But you were delivered from that grave and now exalted above every other. And because of that, this motley crew here at Brick Lane is joined and united to you. And we are called children of the Heavenly Father. And we can call you both our Savior and our brother. Jesus, we cannot comprehend this and we cannot thank you enough for it. And eternal Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us to delight in the Lord. May the desires of our hearts not be wasted on temporal pleasures, but rather to know you better. May we fix our eyes on our great high priest crushed for us, who is now pleading for us before your throne. Spirit, give us such confidence in the gospel that we run joyfully to you, even amidst our unsettled hearts. Would you strengthen our faith to believe that you're working all things for our good and help us to trust that whatever you ordain for us is right. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just stay seated. We're going to sing that song, Whate'er My God Ordains Is Right.
Well, we have confessed our sins and God has a response for us. From Psalm 37, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The salvation of the righteous? Oh, but you may say, if the men and women around me could have heard the sins that I just confessed, no one would call me righteous. But brothers and sisters, here is the gospel from 2 Corinthians. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. Praise be to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Would you stand and sing? standing as we read again from Psalm 37 responsively. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish, like smoke they vanish away. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Let's read this next verse all together and encourage one another from Hebrews 12. Therefore, Therefore since, since we are, are surrounded, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. This next hymn is a prayer asking God to help us do that well. verse 3 as the music plays. As John comes to pray, would you pray with him in your heart as opposed to just listen to him pray? Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, you are a holy, perfect, and just God. You have allowed flawed people like us to pray to you because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for loving us far more than we deserve. God, for those of us who are able to worship together in this church building, thank you. And for those who are able to worship from home, thank you. Thank you for your provision. God, we are grateful for how you provide for our financial needs. There's food on our tables, roofs over our heads, and countless additional blessings that you have provided for us beyond what we deserve. We thank you for the provision of offerings each week at our church. Bills, paychecks, missions, operating expenses, you continue to provide faithfully. God, we thank you for the meaningful Christians that you put in our lives. 
a family member, a friend, a coworker, a teacher, each one of us knows someone that has shown us Jesus in a way that has impacted us for life. Thank you for how you use your saints to encourage us and help us to persevere. Lord, we thank you for our church leaders, our pastors, our staff, elders, deacons, committee members. God, their work and their sacrifice is majorly unseen by people, but you indeed see, and we thank you. We thank you for our political leaders, for our president, our governors, our representatives. We know that all authority comes from you, Lord. Your word tells us that governing authorities exist because they have been instituted by you. Please guide our leaders in their decisions. Bless those in authority who seek to do what is right, just, and honorable, and pleasing to you. God, thank you that hardships are not wasted on a Christian. Although it's the last thing we want in our lives when hardships happen, it builds character, perseverance, humility, and a Christian life that is modeled more closely to Christ and his perfect, being perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God, we want to ask for your help, wisdom, and guidance through the difficulties many of us are facing. For those who are unemployed, God, please help them to find a job that fits their skill set and gifts well. But we also pray for those who have jobs but are unsettled and challenged in ways now. Many are adapting to changing work environments. Some are working from home but would rather be working at an office or a job site. Some would rather just be home, period. For these we ask for your endurance and your perseverance. Lord, Nate Hampton will soon be traveling home from the Czech Republic, transitioning from full-time missions into a new work that you'll be calling him to. God, Nate's August 5th flight unexpectedly got canceled. You know exactly the itinerary, time, date, and seat that he needs. Please provide, Lord. And please help our brother to finish well and to glorify you in these final weeks in Ostrava. Lord, we also lift up another one of our missionaries, Cephas Tushima, and his family, and the recent death of his niece, Deborah. She was like a daughter to them. Unspeakable grief, complex and stressful financial and legal burdens that feel crushing are more than we can comprehend. And we pray to the only one who can relate specifically and personally to the Tushima's grief. You understand their loss. You see their suffering. Lord Jesus, please be near to them now. Lord, our steps are established by you. You are our stronghold in times of trouble. Those who take refuge in you are delivered from the wicked. Help us to continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, who endured great opposition from sinful men and ultimately endured the cross so that we who believe can be heirs of an inheritance that will never be taken away. In closing, Lord, we pray for David Royas. As he speaks, let his words and thoughts be pleasing in your sight. Guide him by your Holy Spirit and do the same for us who hear his message from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, good morning. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of James in the New Testament. Uh, our passage is going to be from James chapter 1. And having a copy of the scriptures will be of great help to you as we go to God's word. Our Father, as we come again this morning, as we open up this passage, it is easy for it to not dawn on us the significance of you speaking to us through what you have written, what you have inscripturated, and for us, Lord, to not tremble before your word. We ask for a sense of your presence and your power at work. Lord, even as I considered this, the 
the depth and the variety of persons and needs that gather here this morning. Lord, we are insufficient and we lack wisdom. And we turn to you and we ask that you would be with us and that you would reach into every corner of need in this room and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it's easy to start, but it is difficult to finish. Uh, that's a phrase that um, my wife and I say to one another most mornings when we drive to church. We didn't say it to each other this morning because we were on the way here, but on the road from our house out of our development uh, to where we would gather for worship on Sunday morning, uh, the, the, the road that we would take, um, there was a house that at one point began a construction project. And maybe you see where this is going, but there, the, the, the foundation was dug and the walls were put up, and I know very little about construction, you can tell, but at some point, <clears throat> as, um, as progress was looking very hopeful and exciting, I don't know when, but as we would go to church every morning, at one point, all progress ceased. And um, we would drive past and see that, you know, our, our house that we were the nosy neighbors spying on hadn't made much progress. Up until, I'm not sure, I think it may have been a family issue or a lack of finances or personal problems, but all that stood was a finished bottom of this expansion, but raw insulation at the top. So we would drive past the house and we would say, well, it's, it's easy to start and it is difficult to finish. That principle is applied to construction and it is also applied to Christianity. It reaches far and wide, and I'm sure that you can apply that to whatever certain situation you're in, perhaps sports. I think you could copy and paste that onto most things, relationships, but that organizing phrase, in many ways, is what we are going to hear this morning as we read from the Bible and as we come to the scriptures. Uh, I've asked you to turn to James chapter one, and see, James, has been somewhat of a mentor to me in these culturally turbulent times. Let's call it that. The book of James and this, this man, this apostle who inscripturated this under the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit has been a mentor to me and one of the eye-opening things that we've already sung about and heard in our service is James has a remarkable two things that he puts together. Here's what the apostle does. He equates blessedness with steadfastness. Those are two things we don't normally join together, but the book of James is going to equate, equate blessedness or the happy life or joy with what he calls steadfastness, keeping on, keeping on. And it's my hope that you'll see that as we read, if you begin with me at James chapter one, verse one, we read the following, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So those four verses were written, the author identifies himself as a man named James. Now, James is certainly a pretty popular name in the ancient Near East, so we have some pre-work to do because the author doesn't say who exactly who he is. He doesn't say, this is James, son of so-and-so. That means he is assuming that, at least to his original audience, he is someone that people would know. So let's consider who is the author of this. We have three, maybe four options. This could be James, 
the brother of John, son of Zebedee, that he would be one of the 12. That's one option. We also have James, son of Alphaeus. That's another James because people like to name their kids James, I guess. And we have James, who's the brother of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that James, son of Zebedee, James, the brother of one of the 12, he is killed in Acts chapter 12. So the timing doesn't work. It's not him. So we have James, son of Alphaeus, and if I ask for a show of hands, how much do you know about James, son of Alphaeus, who's also one of the 12, we'd probably get some head scratches, and I don't really know much about him at all, which is exactly the point. So we are left with perhaps James, the brother of Jesus, because the author assumes you know who this is. James, the brother of Jesus, we know from Acts chapter 12 and Acts 15, is the leader of the Jerusalem church, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the half-brother of Jesus. And because that is the author, that important context and backstory gives us, I want to say, three remarkable observations to these four verses. That's what I'd like to take you through. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And if that is the case... There are three soul-stirring points, which I believe operate as a spine or an outline of just these four verses. Number one, James is going to give us a powerful testimony. James, number one, point one, is going to give us a powerful testimony. Because look again how verse one starts. It says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So think, who is this man? Well, we know that siblings usually have all the dirt on other siblings. They have a history and they have a backstory. And that's why if you've ever gone to a wedding and the brother gets up to give a toast, you hold your breath and you say, here we go. But that's not what we see here. And the reason for that is you you need to realize contextually that James, the brother of Jesus, was a doubter of Jesus. If he were to share with you what it was like growing up, uh, James would say, I didn't really buy this Jesus stuff at all. Let me give you a couple snippets from the Gospels. We read in Mark chapter 3 this. It says, then he, Jesus, went home and the crowd gathered so they could not even eat. And Mark records, when his family heard about this, when James heard about this, they went outside to seize Jesus because they were saying he is out of his mind. And we read Mark chapter 6 further on. It says, people saying of Jesus Christ, where did this man get these things? And, and, and what is the wisdom given to him? Is this not the carpenter, son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And the crowds we read, this is James's brother. They took offense at him, and Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. James is Jesus' brother who thinks he's nuts. That's who James is. And this is a testimony that is built into this epistle. Or maybe we would also read in the Gospel of John. If you read John chapter 7, it says, Now the the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So Jesus' brothers said to him, Jesus, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples may see the works you're doing because no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. So go, Jesus, show yourself to the world for his brothers did not believe in him. So James is repeatedly, it seems, his family of Jesus is regularly associated with disbelief and not understanding Jesus. And that is the person who I've just made a case to you wrote the book of James. So how is this man suddenly a leader in the Jerusalem church writing books of the Bible? That's the problem of the book of James that we must start with. And the answer to that we find in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me actually invite you to turn there. If you have a Bible, you you just want to flip and keep your thumb in the book of James and jump over to or or back to the book of 1 Corinthians. We, We read in chapter 15... Now, the Apostle Paul is saying this. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Please look at verse 5. 
Paul says that Jesus appeared to Cephas and that Jesus appeared to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Please look with me at verse seven. Paul says, oh, and then, oh, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So you see what the Bible has just done. You see what Paul has just done. What the scripture is saying is that James is actually singled out as somebody who the Lord Jesus Christ went, maybe knocked on his door, and talked to him after he rose from the dead. So we think that what happened is that James, the skeptic, had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He knew the resurrected Jesus, so James the doubter became James the resurrected. Which is why in verse 1... Think about this. He calls himself James the servant. Which is why in verse 1, there is a worshipful start to this book, my brothers and sisters. James does not say, I am the bro of Jesus. Although brother is one of the most popular repeated words all throughout the book of James. When he identifies himself, he doesn't say, I am Jesus' brother. He chooses the word for slave. And in that is a testimony that the man is giving us. He is saying, come what may, before you know anything else about me, you need to know that I serve the Lord Jesus Christ because I met the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an anchor for the soul of this man and perhaps yours as well. So before we even move further into the rest of what this is saying about trials, maybe you see, you please recognize that this book is not primarily the Bible as a whole, but specifically this book of James is not something that is offering you tips or suggestions on how to improve your life, though it may. This book, the words of the Bible, The epistle of James is founded on the supernatural work of God and an empty tomb. And what that means is James is testifying that Jesus of Nazareth is unlike any other man who walked the planet because he rose from the dead and James is saying, I met him. I am saved by him and therefore my goal is to serve him. So right out of the gate, my friends, our passage is signaling us to see our lives like this man's, to see your life as not your own. As a Christian, your service to God, your life on a Monday morning in a coronavirus world, it seems very ordinary, doesn't it? It seems very mundane these days. Uh, It is perhaps mundane, but it is anything Uh, but ordinary, it's because you are raised to new life, just like Jesus was. And come what may, can I encourage you to persevere in what God has called you to do, because your life is really founded on an empty tomb. Your service to Jesus, whatever you are doing, is energized with meaning because Jesus Christ lives and reigns, and he lives and reigns on high. That's the Christian hope, and that's the testimony that we begin with, is that James the doubter, became James the resurrected and testifies to us, I am James the servant. So we have a powerful, a powerful testimony right in verse one. And now after giving us that testimony, here's the second observation. James is going to calibrate our expectations. So if the first point is that James comes out of the gate with a powerful testimony of the resurrection, the second thing we see here is James is going to give us a sober outlook or he calibrates our expectations on life as we follow Jesus. Again, please look back at verse 1. After the the introduction, here is the salutation. Verse 1 says, "To, To the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now, we should think about that for a bit because many New Testament letters, as you know, are written to gatherings of people, gatherings of people, uh, the Christians who are in Rome, you Christians in Corinth, etc. James is not writing to a gathering. He's writing to a scattering. And he calls them the 12 tribes scattered or in the dispersion. So you might remember, wait a minute, there were 12 tribes of Israel. 
So it's something we need to recognize is that James sees some degree of continuity between the New Testament church and Old Testament Israel. He intentionally draws a parallel between this group of people now, which we would call the the, the church. And, And here's why that's important, friends, because just like God's people lived as strangers and exiles, in exile, in a dispersion, in the Babylonian captivity, just like the 12 tribes were scattered and they faced pressure and persecutions and longed for the day when God would gather them together again, James is saying, Church of Jesus Christ, Brick Lane Community Church. You're the 12 tribes under the 12 apostles, and you live in a time when you are not at home yet. You serve Jesus, and he is resurrected, and even though he reigns on high, you feel pressure, you feel persecution, And there is a longing that I am sure, even if I have never spoken to you, I'm willing to bet that there's a longing that you have in your soul for the day when God will gather you again to himself. And maybe you can say amen to that. Do you ever notice that when you're at home, you still don't feel home? Uh, Maybe there's still an unsettledness in your soul You don't even have to read the news to feel that way. And you've wondered, maybe why is that? James tells us why. Let me give you a couple snippets. Please look at verse 2. James says, well, here's why. When you meet trials. I wish that word when was not in the Bible. I wish he changed it to if. But it doesn't say if. James is again arguing. He's setting our expectations. He is saying you will long to be gathered because your encounter with this thing called trouble under the rule of resurrected Jesus is not an if, it is a when. He says, when you meet trials, when you meet trials. And, and, and he is actually asking us to make peace with that when and not to desperately wrestle it into an if like I have done for much of my life. Let me give you an illustration. When um, Megan and I were first married, we, our home was clean. Oh, I loved having, you know, a neat sort of home, I have this compulsive desire to tidy up a mess if I see it, and our home was clean. Maybe you see where this is going. And then we had kids, and it actually used to bother me, why is my home not perfectly clean anymore? And what tipped me over the edge is I came home late one night and I was sneaking into the house, and I think every dad has done this, but I stepped on a Lego. And something inside me snapped, and I said, why is it that my house is just constantly a mess? And over time, I've realized the answers to that. Here's the answer, because children are raised in the context of a mess. And the sooner you make peace with that, you're able to function and thrive as a parent. And all the older parents said, amen. Well, perhaps all the older Christians are also saying amen. Because James, as a mentor, is saying, maybe putting his arm around you and saying, brothers and sisters, you won't actually be able to function properly in God's world until you realize things are a mess and perhaps will be a mess. That's why trials are a when and not an if. And if you have an urge to completely, perfectly tidy up everything in life, it's going to be some struggle. Difficulty, if you look around your family, even God's church, difficulty is going to be detectable everywhere. And I say this with a great deal of respect. I'm sure it's detectable here, too. One pastor author says it this way. It's a longer quote, bear with me. He says, is there anything that is disappointing you right now? Is there a relationship or situation that is leaving you hurt and confused? Are there personal problems that you simply have not been able to solve? Do you ever feel alienated, alone, or misunderstood? Have you had to deal with mistreatment or injustice lately? Have you been hurt angry, fearful, or discouraged? Is there any place in life where you feel like giving up or giving in? 
Does your life ever seem much more complicated than it should be? Does it seem like you're always having to deal with obstacles of one kind or another? Do you wish you didn't have so many problems on your plate? Does it bug you that even the easy things in life don't turn out to be nearly as easy as you thought they would be? Are there problems in your past that still haunt you? Have you ever envied someone else's life? Have you ever wished that you could start over in some area of life, but you, you know you can't? Does your life seem to move too fast for you to ever be able to catch up? And this is the last question. He says, has there ever been a day in your life that was fundamentally problem-free? I don't think there has been. And the answer, and I think the, the, the scripture is actually pleading with us to, for us as God's people to decide now to not be surprised wherever you live, however old you are, there will be trial or suffering and it will enter your door. The last time I did a Bible study on this passage, uh, a woman approached me afterwards and said, I have never been taught a theology of suffering that says to expect trials. She said, Dave, I have cancer. I'm likely gonna die within the year, and all I've ever been told is, you need to believe hard and pray away your cancer. And we prayed together, and she did pass away within the year, and that theology of suffering is cruel. James says that it is not if, he says when. He says, when you meet trials. There's another thing I need to point out. He says, when you meet trials, finish the sentence of various kinds. I, I can't hurry past that because he's, again, think about that. He's saying not only is life full of trials, he says it is full of various kinds. He deliberately qualified that. That word various kinds could be also translated a diverse set, a variety pack, a diverse set. Baskin Robbins 31 flavors of trials. We have, uh, we have children's books that we like to read to our kids in our home. And um, what James, I think, is saying is that um, life doesn't follow the children's book narrative. Do you know how every children's book goes? There's a single problem that the whole book revolves around. So the latest one is that the pig is hungry and he just wants to eat a sandwich. And the whole book is about that. He, the pig can't eat because this problem happens. The pig can't eat because this friend shows up. And the pig is hungry. Can he eat over here? Can he eat over there? Nope, no way that the pig can find food. And, and then that issue perhaps is resolved by the end. You know, the whole book centers around the single problem narrative. There's a trial, single focus, and it's hard. And at the end, the poor pig gets a sandwich. But friends, you know very well and James knows all the more that life is not like that because he is saying various trials. Our lives and our culture do not follow a single problem at a time which find resolution. No, it's more like, well, 2020, the year 2020. It's more like Australian wildfires and a question of impeachment. And then right after that, there's a pandemic and an economic crisis, and it will add to the mix racial and social unrest, all of that in a political election year. And that is not even to speak of the burdens that you carry without that being in the news. That, friends, is unsettling, but it doesn't need to be discouraging because that is the soundtrack of real life. That's the soundtrack of a Christian. As you're doing one thing, this other thing needs attention, and you're not done mourning or grieving this reality before you transition and move on to the next. And the world is a strange place in that it is full of laughter, it is full of information, it is full of tragedy, it is full of mourning. And again, I say this with utmost respect carefully, that there is, I am sure, those of you who feel and endure what I would call acute suffering or sudden suffering. And James says there are some trials like that. They are sudden and they are acute, but there's also a sense of cumulative suffering or chronic suffering, the day in, day out, all the little messes that work together and threaten to rob you of joy and tempt you to give up. James is saying, I understand, but here's the good news. 
don't give up. James gives us that testimony of the resurrected Lord Jesus starts high. He's taking us through this valley of saying, let me set your sober expectations. Let me calibrate your expectation. But here's where he ends. James casts a hopeful vision. That's our third point. That's where we will end our time and these brief consideration of four verses. He gives us a testimony. He sets our expectations. But then finally, he holds out, I think, a life-changing vision. It's verse 2. Would you reread it with me? He says, Count it all joy, my brothers. And verse 3 starts with four. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That is, I I believe, a, a profound statement I have been chewing on, thinking about, and trembling before. Because I think this is what James is saying. Friends, while we do not have control over how our suffering feels, we do have control over how our suffering is interpreted. Let me say that carefully again. While we don't have control over how our suffering may feel, Christian, you do have control over how your suffering is interpreted. Oh, those wrestling matches of, God, why have you forsaken me? And I, ask, I say that without knowing what God has put on your plates. Those are real things. Those are real difficulties. But because Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, because he is not aloof, because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and our God raises the dead, you are being asked to view and to see those things from a position of faith. Right now, our family is figuring out how on earth we're supposed to do our job as missionaries in a pandemic. And the answer is, we don't know. That's as far as I've gotten. If you have ideas, I'd love to speak to you afterwards. And there are, of course, things that have been, that we've endured and thought through and and been in quarantine just like the rest of the world. And there have been times when I have looked around and I've wanted to count it as a curse. And James is saying, don't consider it a curse. Don't interpret what is happening to be God's abandonment. Don't, don't consider it or count it to be fate. He says, count it as joy. Oh, that means consider, interpret, understand that the risen Lord Jesus has his good hand on your life. And that is a key to a life well lived. Must have been during quarantine I was watching TV, which I don't normally do, you know, just channel TV. And it was interesting. I was watching, and on one channel, um, there was one of those really terrible horror movies you know, where there's a killer on the loose kind of movies. It must have been the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or some other terrible movie. So I quickly changed the channel. Anyway, the channel right next to this was a TLC special about a surgeon who saves people's lives. I thought, wait a minute, this is interesting. If I hit channel back, I get the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If I hit channel up, I get surgeon, life-saving, skillful surgeon. I thought, man, in light of James 1, this is an important lesson. How do you count it all joy? I've always asked that. What am I supposed to do to just count? Because it doesn't feel like joy. It won't feel like joy. How do I count it all joy? To count pain as joy is to realize that the hand of God in your life is never the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The hand of God in your life is always the hand of a surgeon who skillfully knows how to wield suffering so that steadfastness is born in you. 
And James says, wait a minute, there is a completeness. Do you see that? There's a completeness that comes only in the lives of those who are tested. There is a completeness. There's a not lacking anything. There's a that arrives in the life of someone who has walked through questions. And that is how God treats his children. He is the master, skillful surgeon. And we endure to the day we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. What does a passage like this beckon us to do? I have three suggestions before I close us in prayer. I think this, even in this season of social distancing and enduring, three applications, they all start with C. Number one, friends, you should commend people, commend people who have endured well. If you've seen people in this body endure and walk and suffer well and continue to honor and their Savior, you should commend people who have endured. Here's a second C. For most of us, perhaps, we should continue to follow Jesus steadfastly through whatever his good providential hand has brought. Continue. Continue to parent your children. Continue to live out your call. Continue to profess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And here's the third C. If you are listening and somehow find yourself outside of the kingdom of God, may I plead with you to come, come, come to believe in Jesus Christ. There is no other hope for this world. There is no other answer for life eternal, and there's no other way for peace on earth to happen unless you are reconciled to God. If you are provoked and recognize that there's an unsettledness that you have in your soul, the answer is to recognize that Jesus of Nazareth is raised from the dead and to bow your knee before him and to say, God, would you please forgive me? At that point, that is when the beginning of God's perfecting, steadfast work will begin in you. We read this about the Lord Jesus in Hebrews. It says, in the days of Jesus' flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. And the Bible says, although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Friends, this is our Savior who learned obedience and as disciples of Christ, would you not give up, but continue to follow Jesus of Nazareth until you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these words that teach us, that, that mentor us, that grow us up into your salvation. Lord, we commit ourselves to you as your children we acknowledge that you are the risen one, the sovereign Lord who upholds all things, and we ask that you would sustain us this week to profess in our souls and with our mouths to our friends and families and neighbors that there's salvation found in Jesus' name, that the kingdom of God continues to grow. Lord, use us powerfully and help us to persevere in what we have, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Could I ask you to stand for the benediction? And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. And would you go in peace?